Digital cameras have revolutionised the way that I describe outcrops in the field. They say a picture says a thousand words and that's as true today as it ever was. With the press of a shutter button, you can collect an entire page of descriptive text in a fraction of a second. But photographs are a bit like spelling and grammar. If you don't get it exactly right, then the meaning isn't clear and in fact it can be completely lost. If you want to know how to collect exactly clear, consistent photographs in the field every time, then this is the video for you. I'm Nick Tate. And this is another video in the series of Fieldcraft for Geologists. This is the headline version for YouTube. If you want the detail on each video, go to the link below in the description. It'll only cost you a few bucks and once you're signed up, you'll get all the videos that are already there, plus anything new that I shoot as I find interesting things in the field. In the old days, good cameras and film and processing were all expensive. So you thought long and hard before you pressed that shutter button. And then you waited two weeks to get the prints, only to discover that the critical shot was out of focus. Nowadays, good cameras are cheap, film is free, and you get the results instantly. The result is an extraordinary jump in the quality of information you can collect and the speed that you can collect it. I use these little TZ80 compact cameras from Panasonic. Most phones have better cameras than this, but I can also operate all of the controls without taking my gloves off. That's not so easy with a phone. For the settings for the camera, you can shoot in program mode and you'll get it right most of the time. I always shoot in aperture mode because aperture controls depth of field and sharpness of the image. And that's really important when you're doing macro shots. I usually shoot between about f5.6 and f8 because that gives you a reasonable depth of field and the best sharpness. I set the ISO of the camera to auto. If it gets really dark, then that ISO will go really high and you'll start to get noise in the image. But generally speaking, noise is far less of a hassle than camera shake. When I'm mapping in the field, I usually take at least two photographs at every outcrop. The first one is of the outcrop itself. I use my geopic for a scale bar and there's a whole nother video on how not to leave that on the outcrop and lose it. So that photograph shows the weathering textures and colours of that rock in the exposed outcrops and any large scale structures that are important for that particular outcrop. It's best to do it in either full sun or full shade. If there's an awkward shadow over a rock outcrop that you want to photograph like this one, put your shadow over the entire area that you want to photograph. If it's a large outcrop like this one, you'll wait for a passing cloud. And the other way is to use HDR mode on your camera. The second photograph is a broken piece at a hand specimen scale. The main aim is to show some small scale relationships inside that piece of rock. But beyond that, try and get a face that's as flat as possible. A piece like this that has all kinds of lumps and bumps on it will always create some shadows. You can reduce that to some extent by pointing that face directly at the sun. I want the sun square on to the face of the specimen. The way I do that is to turn my body until the shadow of the rock is right next to the shadow of my head. That way I know I'm looking exactly down the line of the sun and the light will be square onto that face. Some people like to lick rocks. I'm not so keen on licking them, but I do like to have a wet surface to photograph. The way I do that, just dribble a little bit of water on with my mouth. That gets it wet. I don't have to lick the rock and a little bit of mixed saliva with it helps to stop it evaporating in the blazing sun before I've had time to photograph it. Some people go to all kinds of trouble to put scale bars on the rock, use a pencil or whatever. Because I'm always holding the specimen, 
My fingers are in there and they're a reasonable scale bar for most things. For most rocks, you just want to shoot them in bright sunlight. The only exception to that rule is if the rock contains fresh sulphide. The sulphides are so reflective that in bright sunlight, they just blow out to complete white and you lose all the color and detail in them. In those rocks, you want to shoot them in the shade. The textures in the rock won't be so great, but you'll be able to recognize the sulphides. On a cloudy day or in shade like this, then try to put something dark behind the sample. If you put the sample like that and shoot from above, then the bright white from the sky will just make bright white reflections on the wet surface of the sample and it'll mask the textures of the rock. Likewise, high-vis shirts are a really bad idea because on a cloudy day, when you take a photograph like that, the wet surface of the sample will just reflect all of the yellow and orange colors of the shirt. So there you have it. Photographing rocks can save you a whole bunch of time and effort and if you follow the simple rules here, your photographs will be clear and consistent and they'll transfer the meaning that you're trying to put into your report a lot more easily than writing pages and pages of text.